So hello everyone and welcome to the latest in our series of Big Think webinars for international school leaders, school owners and school groups. We're absolutely delighted that you've joined us at what we hope will be a useful, informative and inspiring session that's all about thinking big about the future of international education. For those of you who have joined previous Big Thinks, and I, I think there are quite a few of you, um, you will know the score by now. But if you're joining for the first time today, I am Susie Williams of the International Schools team at Pearson, and I'll introduce you to today's speaker shortly. But before we get started, I would just like to draw your attention to the chat and the Q&A boxes. So you found it already telling me where you're coming from, but the chat box, if you um, have any technical queries as we go along today, please do pop those into the chat and we'll aim to resolve them for you. And then please use the Q&A box to submit any questions that you have on today's topic. There will be time at the end of the webinar for discussion and we'll aim to get through as many of those questions you pose as we can. So finally, just before I hand over to our speaker for today, um, in order for us to understand a bit more about you, our lovely delegates, we've got a quick poll which will be appearing on your screens now. And in it, we'd like you to tell us, please, what sort of international school or group you're representing here today and what your role is. So I'll just let you have a, a minute or so to fill that in. OK, so results appearing on my screen tell me that 52 percent of you are joining from an international school offering a British curriculum. 21% from school offering an IB curriculum and then 9% offering a mix of British IB and US and 3% offering a US curriculum. 9% of you are joining from a school group and an, a collection of others in there, which is always interesting to see afterwards. 27% of you are principals or head of schools, 9% um, vice principals or deputy heads, 24% of you are members of the senior leadership team. And then we've got curriculum coordinators making up 18%, members of the teaching team at 12%. So that's a really lovely spread. I hope that you find today's presentation really useful um, and valuable for your school as you move into 2022. So without further ado, I am delighted to introduce our speaker for today's webinar, who hopefully you can see at the top of your screens here, Dr. John Taylor. Um, John is Director of Learning, Teaching and Innovation at Cranley School, where he has responsibility for the development of independent learning. He's an experienced teacher, trainer and consultant with experience of working in international schools to develop project programmes, and he is one of the principal architects of the Pearson Ed Excel Extended Project Qualification, as well as other project-based qualifications in the UK. Welcome, John, and over to you. Okay, hello. Is that coming through okay? We are coming through okay at the moment, John, yes. Okay, fine. Yes, apologies. We're, we've, we've had a few uh, ubiquitous technical challenges, um, but let's, let's, let's hope we all get through. Uh, well, it's great to be with you, and um, as Susie said, I've, I've been involved in uh, project qualifications now for the best part of the past 20 years in my, my career in secondary education. Uh, and what I'm proposing to do this morning is uh, just to give you a flavour of some of the developments that I've, I've been involved in and some of the work that I'm doing, uh, how, it, how it impacts on the school of which I'm part, Cranley School in the UK and uh, our partner schools in, in Abu Dhabi and, and in China. And, uh, and really as well, just to throw open this question for debate as well, the, the question about the future of education, the future of assessment, the future of learning. Um, as you all appreciate, I'm a, I'm a big advocate of a project approach. And I hope in the, in the course of the next 20 minutes or so to persuade you that this is both realistic and valuable as things stand as a methodology for our uh, for our learners, but also that it's got a huge amount of potential as we think about the whole challenge of being future ready and getting our students to be ready for the world of the future. So um, I'm going to move us into our opening poll for the presentation. If, if Christian, would you be happy to bring that up on screen? That's lovely. So please uh, pop your thoughts in. There's no right answer as everything with projects. There's no right answer. That's the whole point, really. But it'd be interesting just to get a sense of what your perspective is and where you're coming from as we begin this session. Okay, fantastic. So we've got a good spread. Um, 
probably leaning in a positive direction towards projects. I know the half of us are convinced this is already the way to go, which is useful to me, so I won't spend too much time preaching to the choir. Um, but a good proportion of us as well think, yes, you know, this is uh, something we can add in, but there are challenges, and the question, of course, is how we can find time. So I hope to say something to address some of those questions. Could we go on to the next slide, please, Christian? Uh, so let me say very briefly what I think of as a project. Uh, it's a, a term which has been defined in lots of different ways. And for me, the, the crucial elements are twofold. The first is that a project involves an open question, and I'll say a little bit more about what I mean by that. And the second is that it's a, a personal response. And I, I think those two features, openness and a personal involvement, are really integral to a successful project program and to the, the power of projects as a methodology for learning. And my, my own involvement stems, as I said, from uh, about 20 years ago when I moved into secondary education, having been previously involved in higher education. And one of the first things that struck me was the extent to which students expected, really, the teacher to prepare them for their exams, and really that, that was their sole goal. Um, to tell them the right answers, the answers that will get them the marks in the exams. And it became very striking quite quickly that uh, once, uh, once you've done that, once you've provided the so-called right answer and that's been learned, then really that's job done. And I, I felt strongly that that wasn't all there was to, to learning and I'm, I expect that all of us would agree that there's much more beyond that. Um, and so I, I've been involved in a quest really for methods and approaches that will allow us to go beyond just simply learning the right answers for the next test. And I think the first thing I found was that asking open-ended questions is a good starting point. Because of course, if you ask an open question, then uh, the question, uh, what do I need to know for the exam, for the exam what do I write in the exam, doesn't really arise because by its definition, an open-ended question is, is open. It's, it's subject to different possible answers. And so uh, in that context, uh, it becomes possible for a classroom discussion, debate to get started, students begin thinking more critically and reflect. Uh, so I taught physics at the time, I began in the secondary sector, and uh, I remember if I dropped into a physics lesson a question like, uh, what is time? What came before the Big Bang? Then suddenly the very fact that it was an open-ended question where we could have different possible answers encouraged the class to involve themselves in dialogue and debate and the question brought the lesson to life. Uh, but of course you can debate and, and discuss and then go back to the syllabus and learning Newton's laws of motion or whatever it is you've got to learn for the next test. The question is how can you take that richer, deeper, more exciting, engaging type of learning and make it integral to the curriculum? And I think the answer is through project work because a project involves taking a question like that and then pursuing it in much greater depth and greater length in a way which is personal, integral, uh, to the, involving the, the student's own response as an integral part of it, and in which they can learn valuable skills, and of course in which they can realise their answer in a range of different formats. So the, the project doesn't need simply to be a written essay, it could be a creative piece of artwork, music, performance, video, film, drama, computer programming, all these are valid mediums within which to realize project ideas. So for me, that's project work. It brings learning to life, starts with an open-ended question and involves a real personal response. And as you can see from the slide, it's, it's therefore immediately opening up possibilities for us in our schools and colleges to really bring learning to life, to really restore the joy of learning and to give learners choice. And so many of the questions that we set are prescribed by us. Uh, the exam questions, the essay questions. But with projects, it's the learner's own choice, the question that's at the heart. And that's enormously powerful and enormously motivational. Okay, let's uh, move on. Uh, so next slide, please, Christian. So I've, I've really already touched on this, the, the rationale, and I won't elaborate much further, other than perhaps just to draw out one point at the top of that list, which I, I recommend to you as a, a point of consideration, particularly at the moment as we're beginning to become more sensitive to the need for a diverse range of ideas to be explored in our curriculum. And that's a real challenge if you're working towards a prescribed syllabus. 
because at the end of the day, you're going to teach what was required by that uh, curriculum. But if we want to embrace diverse perspectives, we need a, a methodology that allows the learner to have some control over the content and direction of learning. And that's what a project approach does, because of course, it's the learner's choice that goes to the very heart of, of the programme and drives that programme forwards. Okay, next slide, please, Christian. Uh, so I, uh, a phrase that we've used, uh, and, and you'll see if you type in Pearson in Future Ready, there's a fantastic microsite we've built, richly packed with resources to support all of this. And we use the phrase Future Ready Learning. And I like that because it, it captures the idea of something which I think we'd all agree upon, that we are trying in education to prepare our learners for the world of the future. And what does it mean in practice? So here's my, my simple equation. Uh, future ready learning is equal to core content plus project skills. And, and I, I want to emphasize that I'm not one of those that, that thinks that projects are to be done at the expense of knowledge or a core curriculum. Obviously, we need to have a framework of knowledge on which to build, that's un unquestionable, but we need so much more. And it's when we link together the content and the skills that learning really comes to life. And uh, uh, for what it's worth, my own perception at the moment, and perhaps this is uh, somewhat a reflection on the UK's perspective, it may not be true for you in different parts of the world, but based on my own perspective at the moment, I would say we've balanced that equation strongly on the content side, and it may be time to start thinking about rebalancing. Not um, revising everything and throwing it all away and starting again, just rebalancing. Maybe giving a little bit more focus, a little bit more curriculum time to skills development, to activities that allow learners choice and freedom to explore in their own way and in their own preferred mode of learning. And perhaps that rebalancing will then equip them better for the, for the world of the future. So that's my, my proposition really for debate and it'd be interesting to get your reactions to that in a few minutes. I mentioned on this slide as well that, um, oh, thanks, thanks, Christian, that uh, it's a more COVID secure way of learning. You might find that surprise, a surprising thing to say because of course, uh, project work tends to involve practical work, it tends to involve creative work in workshops and laboratories, to studios. How can it be uh, done if we're working online? And I think part of the answer to that, as I've said, is that it begins with questions and challenges that the learner chooses for themselves. And those can come from their world, from their home life, from the world around them, from issues that they've encountered in the media, which they're concerned with, real world project challenges. And so it becomes possible to explore those, uh, whether they're at home with working remotely and, and having to dial into a lesson, or whether they're in a conventional classroom. Hence, I think projects are not ruled out at all by the, the times where we all had to make use of remote learning. Uh, so next slide, please, Christian. So let me give an example of, of that methodology of lending content and skills. So I found myself at the first uh, time that we had a lockdown in the UK in, in April of 2020, having to work ways of teaching some uh, year nine physics that, that would be accessible to, to my learners even whilst they were all, all at home dialing into my lessons uh, and uh, chatting online. And so I, I found that projects worked fantastically well. So a, an example of one uh, could be used here is uh, designing a film to illustrate how to improve energy efficiency in the home place. So you can see immediately that that's something that could be done from home. They can get, go and get little video clips of the, you know, the devices in their home and how they're using or wasting energy. They can start thinking about the layout of their windows and insulation and so forth. It's also an activity which has got a, a skills focus as well as a content focus. Design a film, start thinking about how to communicate your ideas in creative media. So this is for me the heart really, of future ready learning. Activities that allow us to cover subject content and also teach project skills simultaneously. And I, I, I offer this as a solution really to those of us, and there was quite a percentage of us who are obviously sympathetic to project work, but wonder how we're ever going to find the time and I think part of the answer is to look at the assignments that we're setting as parts of our schemes of work and give them a, a project twist, find a way of incorporating a skills focus to go along with the subject content. 
Okay, so that's uh, my opening stage in how I would begin to get project work blended into my curriculum, into my scheme of work. So assignments that combine content and skills, teaching uh, those future ready skills as well as covering the core curriculum. Thank you. Christine, can we go on to the next slide, please? I mentioned the, the future ready uh, framework, and uh, much of the resource that we've built there concerns the Pearson project qualifications. You may well be familiar with them, but if you're not, uh, we have a suite of qualifications uh, spanning foundation, higher tier, and extended level three stages. So really qualifications that go all the way through the, the range of grades for GCSE, uh, from the foundation to the higher tier, and also uh, A-level standard with the extended project. Uh, these have been going, the project qualifications have been going for a few years now, but we, we built this suite of resources to give you uh, a really read, a ready-made toolkit for implementation of projects within your curriculum. And I recommend that. Uh, it's it's free, freely available as a resource, and uh, there's the student-facing content as well as material for mentor training, uh, a whole, pack, whole rich package there. But my, my advocacy really of the extended project in this context is, is really geared to the goal of, of deepening our, uh, our embrace and our, our implementation of projects and making it more than just something you maybe do at the end of the year in a week or two when the exams have been done. Actually starting to move it into the more into the mainstream and making it a really integral part of, of the curriculum. Um, and, and the project's qualifications, you may well know, have been established now. They've got a very good reputation. They've been welcomed by higher education as being very valuable vehicles for teaching the kinds of skills we've been discussing. So I recommend those to you if you're not familiar with them. And I recommend that resource to you if, if you are already making use of them. So I think it's a good point as well to in, in, encourage you, if you've not already done so, just to pop a comment or two. I can see chat comments coming through. Uh, maybe you could at this point as well drop in a, a, a quick summary of what you uh, within your school or college are doing uh, with project work. Are you, are you using it? Would you like to use it more? In what forms are you using it? Where does it sit? Are you using the project qualifications or not? Uh, just if you are happy to share a, a thought or two just about your own experience of uh, the incorporation of project work within the curriculum. That would be really interesting and useful for the rest of us to see uh, where, where we're all going with this. So as I continue to talk and um, we move through the seminar, please do just start to put some of those comments into the chat thread and uh, in, in a minute or two, we'll perhaps come back and reflect on some of those. Okay, so whilst, whilst a few comments come in, let's, let's go through one more slide and then we will perhaps come and discuss some of those comments. So I've included here, uh, a bunch of examples which are loosely based on projects that I, I've seen from, from learners. And as you can see, I've, I've, I've framed them all as, as real world challenges. I think this is, for me, another dimension that makes project work so rich and so powerful, so important as we think about the future of education. Because our, our students care about issues like the environment, like social media, like mental health. These are questions that, that existentially affect them. And we need to give them time and space and a framework within which they can respond to these very significant challenges that we all face. And again, project work has immense power, offering a, a chance for them to respond creatively to these issues that they may well be uh, wrestling with or challenged by themselves personally. You'll notice as well that all of these are in the form of a question or a, a design challenge. And as I said at the start, it's when we have an open-ended question, a question that we can then explore and investigate and take in different directions where there's really no right answer at all. That's when learning really becomes deep and powerful and effective. So uh, again, I recommend some of these as thought-provoking starters and questions which you could perhaps uh, encourage the questions like this, the, the ones that you can perhaps encourage your learners to begin to engage with. Okay, so I'm just going to pause. Uh, Susie, do you want to share? We've had a few comments I can see coming in on the chat thread. Sure. So um, I'll do them in order. There's a couple come in. So Colette um, has said that at their school they are trialing um, EPQ in 
EP3 uh, in chemistry and physics with A-level students. Um, ERA has said in IB PYP at their school, they have been participating in projects like Climate Action Project, Teach SDGs uh, projects, and for their PYP exhibition, they used a project-based approach, so a proper integration across the board there, and have started using GRASP's model to explore projects and connect with real life as well. And then Gulam Sawa is saying, interested in learning how a major piece of project work can be incorporated within an IGC, uh, an IG curriculum at Key Stage 4. So there's, there's a, a, a few comments in there about how, how schools are existing uh, using project work at the moment. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, apologies for some background noise on my line. As uh, you might have picked up, it's the start of lesson one here in the UK in the early morning, and uh, they're all very excited for their lessons, which is lovely. Um, yeah, no, great. Uh, let me just um, uh, just pick up on a question about how we can incorporate project work in uh, in at GCSE level. I, I do recommend uh, the the higher project uh, the that is uh, designed was designed as a a GCSE level version of the extended project. It's extremely similar in terms of the assessment structure and, and goals, uh, but slightly smaller in size. Uh, typically, the higher project might be two and a half thousand words and uh, shorter as well. Uh, the recommended program for that is 60 guided learning hours, of which around about 40 hours are spent on project work and 20 hours of, of guidance. So uh, that's uh, that's a framework that's available, and if you pop onto, as I, as I mentioned, the, the Pearson project site, you'll see we've got uh, some hyperlinked documents now which guide you through that and give you examples and resources. Okay, fantastic. Good to good to have those perspectives. Thank you for those. Um, I guess all of us find the the same sort of challenge here, which is about how we integrate this and then how it can can grow within the curriculum. And in the last in the last few minutes, I want to. Uh, say a few words about how uh, my own school at Cranley in the UK and in, uh, our partner schools in Cranley Abu Dhabi and we're working as well now in China, how we are beginning to wrestle with this challenge. And I, I want to say right from the outset that this is very much a work in progress. I don't think of any of us as having arrived or having the perfect solution. But it is the question that I think most about. How can we take this methodology, which once you've tried it, you know it works so powerfully uh, and is so powerfully effective and engaging learner interest and driving attainment and bridging the academic vocational divide, creating more of a, a future ready environment for learning. All, all such powerful stuff. And but then we, you know, how do we make that much more integral across the whole curriculum? Yeah, it's great to have embedded it with, with occasional lessons. Fantastic if we've gone a step further with the extended project, or higher project, foundation project. How can this become part of our whole school approach? So if we can go on to the next slide, please, uh, Christian. Um, I, uh, I, I, as I said, that's been the question I've, I've really been thinking through for the last, uh, well, last six, seven, eight years. Uh, and uh, the, the logo, the framework that we've evolved here at Cranley in the UK, which you can see on the slide there, um, is, is we, we call it Cranley thinking. Um, because obviously, as you'll appreciate, thinking is at the heart of all of this. It's about reflection, dialogue, inquiry, discovery. It's about what goes on when you start asking questions beyond just what do I need to know for the next test. Um, and currently thinking, it's an approach, it's a flavour, it's a methodology, it's not a prescriptive framework. Uh, but what I do in, and try to do my work with colleagues here in the UK is really to to uh, observe, to par partner uh, teachers, to participate in, in, in lessons through observation, and then to have re reflective professional conversations with my colleagues about where they're doing this in the curriculum and, and whether they can take it further. There is escape for some project work, for example, in year nine that we could explore. Could we develop that in, in new areas? Uh, are there ways they can organise their lessons so that more of the independent learning and research focus can come through. And uh, over the years that I've been doing this, I've been curating their responses and, and gathering them. I, I have a tracking spreadsheet where we all input examples of activities that we've done of this character 
and then a, some brief evaluation as well, because of course there are lessons always to be learned, um, and we can't assume we've got it right. So, so that's uh, some of what I've been doing here in the UK. Um, I've also been involved recently with my uh, colleagues in Cranley Abu Dhabi, uh, the head Michael Wilson, uh, I think is on the call, and um, I'm grateful to him and to, to Liz Kelleher for sharing the work that they've been doing. You can probably see it on the slide there. A fantastic new core curriculum that they've been devising, which involves project skills, 21st century skills, philosophical inquiry, threaded through the senior school curriculum from an early stage and building towards uh, frameworks like extended project in the sixth form. Really very exciting work. And, and again, a flavor, I think, of, of where we can go if we're looking at building this as more than just an enrichment on the side, but as something which is part of, part of the whole school learning ecosystem. So, um, so yeah, so as you can see, it's a work in progress. It's, I think, tremendously exciting, challenging, and there's lots of challenges, which I'm sure if you've uh, explored in these avenues, you will, you will appreciate fully the challenges of finding time, the challenges of bringing colleagues on board. But I, I do think as well that uh, this is a methodology that uh, the time has come for it to become much more central. It's always been there, and I think we need to do a lot more of it. And I, I particularly think that if we're setting as our goal, getting our learners ready for the world of the future, then and the project approach is really the place to go. Okay, um, I, I saw a vast number of fascinating comments and questions coming in. So I'm going to stop, stop the direct talk and uh, hand it back to Susie. Do you want to curate those, Susie, and uh, sort of bring up some headlines for us and we can, we can pick them up? I sure will do. Thank you, John. And before I move to the questions, I'm just going to read a comment that Vanessa's put into the chat. Um, so she has put in a comment and, and whilst I'm reading this, everybody, if you um, if you do have questions, do pop them into the Q&A box. But Vanessa said here for our little children, it's perfect for engaging parents and whole families in their child's learning outside the classroom. We regularly send challenges home to celebrate the different weeks we have in the school calendar. And these open ended challenges let children work on items they find interesting or exciting, and it brings the parents excitement along with them. So that's a really good indication of how project learning can be used at the younger stages as well, isn't it? Yeah, that's lovely. Thank you. I mean, uh, 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 dare I say it, uh, I, if you're in, in primary and you know, we're working with younger learners, then, you, you know, everything I said, you'll have just and going well yes that's obvious <laughs> it, it, this is perhaps our sudden secondary sector having to catch up with things that we perhaps would never have forgotten um but yes it's uh the longer i've been involved it's actually so simple isn't it uh, if you ask children uh to work on questions that interest them and if you give them a framework of support to allow them to explore their own ideas unsurprisingly you see the best quality outcomes and uh uh, it's, been, it's been fascinating working with, with colleagues here at, uh, at the school across the road, just beginning to see that many of the questions and challenges that they've embraced when they've done project work have been the very same questions that my own learners 10 years further on want to engage with. Uh, very same, very same, very similar sets of issues. Um, and I think that says something about the importance of this at all stages. And of course, if in our schools and colleges we can build from the ground upwards and, and make this the core of our, our learning methodology that they, they imbibe right from the start. That's so much better than trying to shoehorn it in at key stage three after 10 or 15 years where they, they think learning just means getting ready for the next test. So I really would endorse that comment about uh, the power of this in primary for sure. It keeps those independent learning skills and investigative skills really current, doesn't it? And keeps them front of mind for children. Um, so Vanessa has actually put a question as well in the Q&A. Um, so open ended questions allow students to show what they know. How do you see this impacting project based learning in international schools where the home language of the children may not be the language of school instruction? Yeah, great question. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. So I, I, I think part of the answer is uh, I mentioned um, I mentioned the project qualification and the different levels. So I would recommend looking at things like the foundation project, which is really geared to, uh, for those of us who have long enough memories, foundation stage of GCSE. It's a few years since we had that now. 
uh, but that's roughly grades one to three or four, I suppose, at GCSE. Um, and, uh, you know, that provides a very accessible entry level. And the other thing that I would mention is that you can utilize the diversity of outcome types within the project framework. So whilst many students do write uh, essays and, and therefore their uh, linguistic skills are going to be drawn upon, you know, performance work, um, making up a, a script, forming a play, which, which could be, doesn't have to be um, in the, the language of a seventh if, if they want to bring in elements from a uh, second language into the actual script, an obvious place to go, or artwork, which again can transcend the linguistic boundaries. Using these most creatively, I think, is, is part of the answer. And for me, this is just another illustration of how powerfully flexible the project approach is, that it, we, there's a whole bunch of barriers there which are, we, we try our best to get over with our mainstream approach and the, the written exams and essays and so forth. But with projects, there are so many other routes you can take. And uh, according to the needs and interests of your learners, those may well be more effective. Lovely. Thanks, John. Um, so Michelle is asking, um, her idea of projects is that they require a lot of time dedicated to them. Can they be effective if they are short term or time based? And so, for example, she says she she takes three weeks to teach a topic. So, for example, IG physics, and then she wants to move on to the next topic. How does she now do that and include a project on the topic completed? Yeah, great question. Thank you. Um, I, I, it is a chart time is one of the big challenges, really. Um, and what I found, I, I you know, I, I put my hand on my heart and say, yes, I, you know, I do agree that there's a limit to what you can do if you're if you're running through the units at the rate of one or two or three weeks. Uh, and hence, why if you can also find some curriculum time for things like EPQ or HPQ, so much the better. But I would also say, and this is based on my own experience trying this out with my year and I physics students over the last two or three years, that just twisting those assignments and making them into mini projects type, type assignments. So like an example of spend, two, spend a week, spend two weeks creating a, a film, a presentation, a slideshow uh, to illustrate how you can make your home more energy efficient. You can cover your core content and you can build some skills. One of the great things as well is as our learners are so now so fluid and so digitally adept is that they're very very fast i find now uh, in fact it shocks me sometimes how quickly they can assemble much better quality presentations than i can uh, so, so you can get a long way even in a single lesson um, so i would really encourage you to think about okay maybe i've only got two three lessons but i could still set a mini project aside as long as i'm covering my core syllabus content i build some skills into it as well get them working collaboratively um, I mean, it's been another almost 100% shift for me in, in seeing collaborative working go, go from something that you did occasionally, maybe once in a, an experiment you set up in a laboratory and you work in teams, through to being my main mode of working. I, almost all the presentation assignments I get them to do, I get them to do collaboratively. So they're building all those valuable skills. They like it because, of course, they, it's a little less work for them individually, but they still get a great resource at the end that they can keep for the future. So... Um, there's, there's a lot. There's, there's a lot we can do within the framework. That's, that will be my my short. Brilliant. Thank you, John. Um, so Kevin has asked a question. Oh, well, it's more of a statement, but I think it's got a. Um, it, it's it's worth looking at. So Kevin's concern is the difference between the focus of the project and the scope that a subject has to cover, and the time consumed to manage them in key stage four or key stage five. So I guess that's another question about how do you integrate it into your exist. You know, the the scheme of work that you have to cover. Um, and you spoke about that yeah. earlier, didn't you, about shift that shift between project work and core content? Yeah, it's a, but I, I you know, I'll be honest, it's a continuous battle. And um, some, ironically, perhaps, for the times that it's been uh, best and, and, and most rich have been when, <laughs> when we've had a little bit of a, a relaxation of the requirements. I'm thinking now about 2020 when we, the exam cancelled and so many lots of teachers were thinking, Oh my, I've got a few weeks now. There's no more revision classes. And you may have seen on the on the, again on the, the Pearson Project website, we, we put together rapidly prototyped a framework called um, Project Express, which was designed to fill that gap really and give you a, 
a, a framework for doing a, a major piece of project work within the scope of two to three months. And there's probably stories actually from a school, um, uh, TLC private college in, in Cyprus that, that um, piloted that with, with great effect. So yeah, very difficult. And uh, again, you know, hand on heart, uh, my own experience is it's easy to do this, let's, let's, let's say, at the end of key stage three or early in key stage four, it's going to be easier than as you, as you get towards the exam deadlines. And the same in the sixth form, uh, you're, you're going to be able to do this much more effectively in the first year of a key stage three program than as you get near to your exams. But all of that is, you know, there's a lot that can be done still within that framework. Lovely, thank you. Uh, Rose has asked, how do we track the students' progress and monitor what is done or being done at all during the course of project time? Well, uh, no, that's where the technology is your friend, uh, because uh, nowadays, if you've got them working on a, you know, a shared document, which tracks through, uh, you know, I use Google Docs, I'm sure with Microsoft and other platforms will, will have similar for tools, uh, you, you really can see almost well, literally down to the minute actually what progress they're making and and that actually is that's a very very significant point you've raised there because uh it's the continuous worry of teachers once they let learners become independent is knowing where they've got to and whether they're progressing and um i i really do believe strongly that we we've got to observe and track and, and intervene as well if they're not making progress and you can't just let them drift along for six months and then find that nothing's happening but the, the technology, just having to play with things like the version history or tracking, you know, a shared document, so much, so much power there. Uh, and I, I'd add as well that I increasingly, I, I mean, one of my one of my phrases for this for the students is um, the best the best way to write the project is to write the project. You know, I, I I just believe in them getting on with it and moving quickly through. You know, I have a little rule that they should produce two hundred and fifty words every week. And uh, if they do a little bit in tweet, suddenly the project starts to take shape and, and it's, all, it's all fine. So keeping them moving and keeping an eye, it, it is absolutely essential. Great, thank you. And there's a question here from Jessica saying, I always feel that projects have to be heavily scaffolded if students are to achieve the intended objectives. How can this be tackled? Great. Oh, ah, there's a whole no, another day of training, isn't there? Here, uh, scaffolding totally, absolutely got to be scaffolded. But it's not an all or nothing with scaffolding. I, I scaffold very, very heavily at the start. Uh, lots of intervention, lots of direction, lots of structures, lots of guidance, lots of teaching. Project learning is not innate. It's something that has to be taught. They need to be taught these skills. And so, yeah, giving them frameworks, showing them worked examples, showing them model answers uh, or model projects from previous students is very, very powerful. But it's all about a transition and a transfer of responsibility so that as the process unfolds, learners become more and more confident and the scaffolding starts to be falling away. And if all goes well on the project journey, what you will see, and I, you see this, there's a CDEPQ, you see this time and time again, the, the students move from being, at the start, quite dependent, looking to you, the mentor, for guidance and direction, through to the point when they're beginning to take charge. And by the end, and this happens when they stand up to do their presentations, really, they're the expert. They've actually become more knowledgeable in almost all cases about their topics than I am. And it's the most rewarding experience for you as the, as the mentor to be able to sit. And you, you've gone from being the sage on the stage, the guy by the side, to, to a member of the audience, to someone who's listening to them as they teach you. So, so the answer is yes, scaffold for sure, but disassemble it as you go and let the responsibility move to the, to the learner. Wonderful. Thank you, John. Well, we've just got one minute left, so I'm going to bring the webinar to a close. Just say thank you to everybody for asking your questions. Um, I hope you found John's answers useful. I know I did. I have a son um, who is 17 and is just embarking on his um, extended project qualification so I will be showing this video to him later um, so thanks to John and everyone who has joined us here today certificates of attendance and a link to the recording to this webinar and also a digital badge to mark your attendance will be sent to you by email and I will just give a quick plug for the next big think in our series which takes place on Tuesday the 1st of March so a month from today 
where we will be discussing the languages challenge and specifically how to ensure diversity, equity and inclusion for languages in schools. Registration for that webinar is now open on the Big Think landing page, so I do hope you can join us for that one. And thank you again to everybody who joined us from around the world and have a great rest of the week. Um, take care and thank you again. Bye bye, everyone.